if a creek, so you, you're talking uh, mid-thaw, so let's just address it like mid-thaw. Um, if, if a creek is really running fast and, and, and deep, you'll hear it from a distance. And I'm sure perhaps you've heard them roar before. Um, so pretty much on all the Sierra creeks, there will be a, uh, a descent down into the creek. The creeks um, are largely er erosion created, um, but the big ones are, are uh, glacier created. So it's a little bit different picture, both to the slope of the creek, uh, which implies how rough the bottom of the creek is gonna be. And I'll get into all this later. But what I'm getting at is from the top, before you descend down to the creek, if you can hear it roaring from there, you know you're probably not gonna find anything decent as far as a safe crossing where the summer trail crosses. Summer trail is not designed for you early season hikers. It's designed for, for stock and summer hi uh, hikers. When you, you're not gonna see anything through the snow and the trees and stuff like that, or maybe you're on dry trail and you're walking on up until you actually get into the channel or you get to the rim of the channel. And the creeks, for the most part in the, in the Sierra, are anywhere from, you know, uh, 20, 20, 20, 50, I don't know, 18, 18 to 30 feet wide. And uh, at the height of their, for, for the majority of the creeks, not the, not the glaciated creeks, but the majority of the creeks, um, they're going to be about two feet deep, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, about two feet deep, right in that vicinity. Now, your big guys way down low, like Evolution Valley, <clears throat> down in the glaciated canyons, those can be very deep. Um, but it's also a flat, uh, it's flat terrain. So let me talk on that. The reason why I mentioned the slope of the train, and, and this kind of will tie in with your videos you've seen, when, when you... Uh, have such steep creeks like you have in the Sierra, the steeper, the faster the water moves, the more erosion. So therefore, the bigger the rocks in the bottom. So uh, where you, you may have seen people crossing in a train fashion, facing upstream, stepping sideways, holding on to each other to cross the, the, the stream. That might have been, and I'm just kind of guessing, that works for where the terrain is flat and you have a gravel bottom or you have a sandy bottom or you don't have obstacles in the path for somebody to run into while they're sidestepping. And you can step over some stuff, but some other things you just crash into if the water is white water <clears throat> because white water is created when, when the water catches air. It, it hits a boulder and it goes flying up and over the top and it catches air and it lands and it splashes and it goes every which way. <clears throat> and there's a lot of air in the water. So you can't see the bottom. But if you see a white water situation in front of you, assume there's big boulders in there, something that's causing the water to fly up. Also remember that if, if water hits a if water hits the proverbial boulder, it's going to go not only over the top, but it's going to go around the sides. It's going to go both ways. So if you're standing down here and the water is flowing in this direction, let's tilt, tilt, tilt it a little bit you're going to get hit from three locations standing downstream of that boulder. You're going to get hit straight off the top from the water going over the top, and you're going to get hit from three o'clock and nine o'clock for water going around the rock. So, and it alternates. It doesn't mean that it's like a, a, a kitchen faucet or a, a water coming out of a hose. Um, you've got so much interaction from water going over other boulders nearby that one affects the other. So you'll have brief bursts of pressure against your legs. <clears throat> I shouldn't say brief, I should say intermittent that push you in different directions as you try and move across the creek. I say across because when the boulders are tall, when there are branches and sticks and other crap in the creek that you can't see, but your foot runs into it, um, you, you can't, it's not wise to, to be one, unbalanced, duh, and, and two, um, working the small muscles of your body to do a lot of big work. Now, what I mean by that is 
there's a th what I when I teach creek crossing and we we did it for years and years and years. I give you different methods, different techniques, things that will work in one creek and may not work in another because of what you see before you. So the train method where everybody faces upstream and you go sideways across a creek, that works great if there's not a whole lot of elevation gain and there aren't any big obstacles that you're going to have to deal with going sideways because you're not just going to have one boulder. <laughs> you're going to have, oh God, let's see if I can do this. Ah. You're going to have a whole bunch, you're going to have a whole bunch of boulders that you're going to have to, I don't know if I can do this, but you can, you know, imagine these things as boulders. So you're going to have to get your feet through those. Do I want a sidestep where I'm putting a whole lot, I'm facing upstream, I'm leaning against my poles because think, I don't even, you guys can have to imagine out in the snow, we demonstrate this by doing a chain. We create, well, I don't want to even get into that. That's too much. Um, so you want to, in this case, with a train and you're going sideways, you're, you're hanging on to the person in front of you. If you, you're taking the broad side of your foot, here's another great example. When you have an ice axe, you can grab shit that falls on the ground. In this case, I've got to grab a shoe. That's beyond my reach and it works great. You just imagine this, rock, shoe. I want to get, actually it works better. See, it's one thing to hear somebody talk about something. It's, it's, it's just so much better to actually watch the demonstration. All right, two rocks, foot. If I'm going sideways, if there's just two rocks, okay, maybe I can step over. But remember, as soon as you pick your foot up off the bottom, it's getting pushed. And when the volume is deep and the flow is fast, your aim is shitty. <laughs> In theory, you can say, all right, I'm going to step up and over, and I'm going to land on this side. In reality, as soon as you come up, you're going to be pushed backwards. Then you're going to fight the current and you're going to fight the current because it's moving your foot and how you land may not exactly be where you want to land. And so therefore you're going to suddenly find that I'm picking up and going over. Oh, now I'm catching an edge on a boulder that I didn't see. And that's going to throw you over. So it's really not cool to do it sideways when you're in a boulder littered stream, which is typical for the Sierra. So we really have to put this in context. So, well, <laughs> you can tell I've never done this. Um, try and control the boulders. All right. Better is instead of sideways, moving your feet sideways in a boulder stream, go toe first and wiggle your feet between the rocks or maybe even stand it on top of the rocks. The only drawback to this is your foot may get stuck between the rocks. So whatever you wear for creek crossing shoes, make sure that they're laced at the top so they can't be pulled off. And this goes true for your, um, your snow baskets on your poles. They can get ripped off in creeks, so you carry a second one. All right, so what am I getting at? When you come to the side of the creek, assess it for how steep it is, how fast the water's moving, how deep, uh, it is, of course, you can't tell because you're, you, you have no way of measuring how deep it is. Um, look for uh, 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 safe ways down into the creek, safe ways to get out of the creek. Look downstream for anything that might pin you, trap you, uh, hold you underwater. We call them strainers. Um, you you want to have lots of distance downstream where there's nothing in the creek that could hold you under. Typically, it's like a, a tree that fell across and there's a lot of branches underneath that are going into the water. You go into that, you're not getting out. Um, stuff like that. So you want to look for those details while still on the creek side. You want to, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some things. Uh, if the creek right there looks like, gosh, man, this is way over my head. I don't like this. It looks nasty. Where might there be a safer place to cross? And indeed, you do not, take away expression, acorn, you do not have to cross a creek where the summer trail crosses. If it looks bad, it's over your skill level, 
Uh, for example, the creek crossing uh, of Evolution Creek at the trail can be pretty nasty and the run out is fatal because there's waterfalls right on the other side downstream. So better yet, this is your other takeaway or another, the safest place to cross will be clearly like a beautiful fat log crossing. If it's wet and slippery, wear your crampons so you can, you can dig in and hold. Um, otherwise, uh, if it's got rotten bark, try and kick it off as you go across. You don't want bark to suddenly release and you fall into the creek. <clears throat> so look for, for logs that are viable. If the, if, the, if the log is too small, clearly it's not viable. Oh, I could scoot across on my rear end. Well, if it looks like you can, then give it a try. There's nothing wrong with trying something. Uh, but if it doesn't feel comfortable, go off of that spiritual sixth sense. And if you don't feel comfortable, bail. Don't even do it. I don't care if somebody else in your group can do it. If you don't feel good about it, don't do it. <clears throat> Log crossings are ideal. Uh, rock hops are great. If you can go from one rock to another and work your way across the creek, wonderful. If they're wet and slippery, once again, wear your crampons or your micro spikes <clears throat> so you can have much better uh, traction and grip. Um, you, can, you can go uh, through bushes, uh, you know, jump from island to island and get through bushes and work your way across like that. <clears throat> um, but if those aren't available and you searched a mile up and a mile down, because that's what you're going to do, you're going to come to the side of the creek, you're going to have that stop moment. Remember last night, the acronym stops, S-T-O-P stands for stop, think, observe, plan. First, and for through hikers, it's really rough because you guys just want to go. <clears throat> and if you start, you're starting late, you've got all the more reason to be going because you do have a deadline, as we talked about last night of the, the first snows in, in Washington. But after searching and you don't find anything for a dry crossing, because that's ideal, who wants to get into the, into the cold water? And it's not just cold, it's snow melt. So that means that your legs are gonna go numb. You're not gonna feel your feet. So if your feet get punctured by a little stick that's sticking up in the bottom of the uh, creek, you're not gonna know it. And then you're gonna deal with an infection the next few days and that may send you home. So you got to have good pre-crossing shoes for those little sticks. Look for meadows. Meadows are where the terrain is flat. Therefore, the water is moving slower. Ter this terrain is flat, so the water will now spread out and flood the meadow. Therefore, it is shallower. So one, you have a smoother bottom. Two, you have a shallower depth. Three, you have less velocity. It's not going downhill in a mad fashion and creating white water. Um, so you could also four, see the bottom. If there's any obstacles, a dead old tree branch down there that's sticking up, uh, but yet half buried in gravel. Um, so look for a meadow. If you're, if you're really good at that and you don't have much time and you figure, well, what the hell? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I just got to the creek crossing. I don't have much time because of whatever your reasons might be for the day. And you think, well, what the heck? I'm really good at crossing in meadows. I'm going to go, I'm going to look at my map. So right then, pull out your topo map, paper, uh, electronic, whatever, and look for a place where there's no green trees. That's the first indicator. Place uh, where uh, maybe it says meadow on it, whatever. A place where the contour lines, uh, the, the brown contour lines are far apart. Um, that's where it's going to be flat or flatter. You may have to go a distance, depends upon where you're at. If you're trying to cross a creek in the middle of, what the heck was that called, Woods Creek, you know, going up toward Pincho Pass, that's pretty steep. And it's pretty steep for a long ways. So uh, you might have to be going cross country for quite a ways, up or down, whatever, uh, in order to get to that meadow. And then after you cross in the meadow, you're gonna go cross country back. You'll get used to it and it's not all that rough. So don't be afraid of it. Just have a good map and have a good awareness of where you are in the midst of everything and where, where the trail is. Because there will be times when you are a distance from the trail and there's nothing wrong with that. You're not lost. When you're over there and the trail is over here and you know it, are you lost? No, you're just not on the trail, which is perfectly fine, especially when you're on snow. Okay, so go to a meadow. That's gonna be your safest 
place to cross because you can see the bottom, the amount of push is minimal compared to the steeper areas. Um, so the bottom is smooth, the depth is low, the push is light, uh, and you can see the bottom. And there's usually no strainers downstream in case you should fall. The techniques for going across. So that's where to cross. Techniques of crossing vary. We talked about the train where everybody moves, you know, sideways. That's all great. There's another one where people can, can huddle up, you know, in threes and fives and stuff like that. But then invariably, because now you have a circle of people moving across the creek, someone's going backwards, some people are going sideways, you know, uh, and it's not comfortable for them. Well, we're, we're not looking for comfort, we're looking for safety. Can they do it? So you've got to realize who are the strong people in the group and you got to know where to put them in the chain, whether it's a train or not, or it's a circle, or it's a group of three, um, even two, two people can, can link arms or link waists, you know, uh, so that you got a good grip on them and move facing the opposite bank and move across the creek. The reason why I'm not a huge advocate of facing upstream is this. First of all, the broad side of your body is getting hit by the, the, the flow of the water as opposed to the narrow side of your body. If you're facing across the creek, the narrow side of your body is now the only thing being pushed. When I use the word push, I'm talking about the kind of thing you feel when you're standing in the water at the beach and a wave hits you. That's push. Maybe it causes you to suddenly sidestep. Maybe it knocks you over. Water has a great, uh, uh, a, pretty, a pretty good density. So therefore, when it hits you, you know, fire hose, a uh, water balloon, something like that. I mean, it is, what is it, eight pounds a gallon or something like that? So water has weight and when it, that weight is moving, so now it has some force. Just because it's fluid doesn't mean it's benign. Doesn't mean it's gonna be a nice little walk across a puddle, because it isn't, especially when it speeds up and it's going downhill and it's going in all directions and you can't see the bottom. All right, so back to what happens when you do face upstream. Not only is the broad side of your body getting hit, but because of the push of water against the broad side of your body, you have to lean into it. Okay, fine, I can lean into it. I can take my two poles and I can put them out at 10 and two o'clock and extend them as far as possible because you want as wide a triangular stance as possible. And you say, okay, Ned, I can do this. It's no big deal. I'm in the water. I've just got in the water. I've taken a couple steps sideways and I haven't hit any rocks. I haven't hit any branches. I got a pretty good balance. You just started, buddy. You, you <laughs> High through hikers are not known for their upper arm strength. You know, hello, back in my day, we didn't even use poles. So yeah, the use of summer poles, you know, clicking along, that's fine. You get some, some muscle use in your arms, but when you're doing isometrics against the force of water, your poor little arms are gonna totally be bitching at you and start shaking and what the hell are you gonna do? If that's the only technique you know, they're gonna fatigue is what I'm getting at. So I rule it up. That's not my first arrow in my quiver to pull to hit the, the bullseye. When you're going across the creek, instead of facing upstream, face across the flow, not only will your shoes be able to, to find their way, because you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna be going by rocks, you're gonna be, you're gonna be standing on rocks you can't see, you're gonna be wiggling your feet between rocks, but it's much easier to run the toes of your, of your shoe between things because you don't wanna pick your foot up because it's gonna get blown away. You're gonna be sliding your feet. It's a shuffle. It's not a, it's a creek crossing, but it's more of a creek shuffle. <laughs> so um, use the narrow part of your foot first. So your toes first, poles at 10 and two, and you're going, well, man, you just said your arms are gonna get tired. Ah, the key here, grasshopper, is that 
I'm not leaning against my poles that much. I'm, I don't have current pushing at me, forcing me to lean into it just to be able to stay upright. I'm not leaning on my arms when, I, when the force of the water is hitting me from the side. It is much easier to do and function in doing uh, and it's really practical. So really those are the key ingredients for anything hiking. It's gotta be functional, practical, um, efficient, easy, that kind of thing. So you're going across the creek, facing the opposite bank. I've got a target location to go to. I see a nice ramp between some bushes that I can then, you know, you don't wanna climb up some cliff on the other side. You don't wanna to have to part the bushes to get, to get out. Search the creek bank for nice ways to go both in and get out of that creek. Extend your poles all the way, put them at 10 and two, stay on top of two feet, only move one thing at a time, a foot or a pole. You take your time. Yes, your legs are gonna go numb. You're not gonna feel your feet. They're gonna freeze, that kind of thing. It's normal. They will thaw out, especially if you're crossing when there's sunlight. If you're crossing while it's snowing, you're in trouble. I wouldn't do it, um, depending upon how, how you can dry out. You may end up, if you're crossing when it's snowing, you may end up pitching on the other side just to get warm because you have neither uh, sun, uh, but you probably have some wind and, and weather that's you know causing those clouds to be there. So it's not really so cool um, unless you can, can, can maintain and create enough heat to stay warm by physical movement. You know, you get out done with the creek crossing and you just keep going. And a lot of through hikers do this because it's like, what the hell, my feet are wet already. My shoes are wet already. What do I need to warm up? I warm up by walking, so let's just go. If you've got dry trail, that's great. If you've got snow, that's not so great because your shoes aren't gonna dry out. You might be able to create a core temperature that's workable by moving because that's how you get warm. Muscle, muscle metabolism creates heat. Use the muscles that creates heat but your feet are not gonna recover because they're still in snow and the snow is frozen water. So it's not good. So then the trench foot problem comes up. Um, all right, so where were we? Kind of midstream. That's the body position. Remember when you pick up anything, it's gonna be pushed by the water, by the flow of the water. Feet are easily controlled. Um, you, pick up, you, you pick up your foot, it's gonna move. You're gonna fight with it to get it back to where you want it. Better yet, shuffle. When they pick up the pole, it just, it just moves. There's no weight to the pole and you've only got the little ability to control it, you know, by hanging on to what, uh, four or five inches or something like that uh, up here, whereas the bottom is going all over. So what you're going to do with your poles is actually take them completely out of the water and stab them down where you want it to go. That works pretty good. So you, you pull out, you test it, you get it sunk in so that you've got a good platform, a triangular platform that's secure, now move a foot test it, like it, put your weight on it. If you're happy with it, then put all your weight on it. And then with your, with one pole advanced, another pole is always to uh, more to your side that your downstream pole, like your downstream pole, when you're making a steep snow traverse is always more toward your side. It's more at nine o'clock instead of 10 o'clock because it's what's resisting. That arm is the one that's resisting the flow of the Creek. So it needs to be a little bit more to your side rather than 10 o'clock. So let's, let's um, amend what I said. Your, your, your upstream pole is more at two o'clock. Your downstream pole is more at nine o'clock. And that creates somewhat of a triangle. After you've made that pole plant foot move, now you're ready to move the other pole and then the other foot and work your way across. Take your time. Um, that, is, that is a technique for one person. For two people, You've now lost two poles, effectively. Yeah, you can hang on to the other guy, which should be the big guy downstream and the small person upstream. But if somebody, if like your downhill person goes, then you both go. Same thing with the, with the train. If the, if the person at the very end of the train is, is weak but protected, if they fall off because they tripped on something, who's going to know except for the, the person that, wow, I don't feel her hands on my waist anymore, or, you know, she's not pulling on my pack anymore. What happened to her back there? I think, yes, the maxim has always been creek crossings when they're nasty, wait for other people. You've got to know how to use those other people. 
grabbing each other in a circle works great for some people in the circle, but not for some others. Some are going backwards. Some are going sideways. Um, when, you're so, when you're secure in doing it yourself, you don't want to also be roped up. Don't fall into that one either, because when you rope up somebody and you think, okay, if they go down, I can pull them to the surface. The water actually doesn't work that way. When you're, it's like, um, God, what's an analogy? Uh, I can't think of one. But what happens in effect is the water overtops the person and by holding on to them, it actually holds, it gets, it pins them to the bottom and it doesn't work. So it's better to let them flounder in the water and try and find their way uh, uh, you know, up to the surface. The water's really not gonna be all that deep, maybe two or three feet deep on the creeks that you guys are gonna be crossing. You're crossing high enough up in the, in the headwaters or toward the headwaters uh, of most creeks, not all. The big ones are, um, the big ones you're gonna have uh, half a dozen or eight or, or so that um, you're way low in the, in the um, altitude. Um, and so therefore you've got miles and miles and miles of acres and acres of snow that's all melting and coming down and funneling right into you. And you might have some deep water, especially late in June um, after a normal winter. Uh, some of these things, you know, you hear these people go like, oh no, it's chest deep. The hell it was chest deep. If the water's that deep, it better be flat. You know, if it's got any velocity, you don't stand a chance. You're gonna wanna float anyway. So you're not gonna have a whole lot of weight on the ground uh, improving your traction to the bottom. So I don't, I don't kind of believe some of those stories. Uh, it may have felt like it, but anyway, let's get, get back to, yeah, you don't want to rope up. Um, you don't, you want to cross, uh, with help of others. If you're in a big enough group and if the, if the bottom is smooth. So if you've got a lot of people find that meadow, do the circle thing, do a train, train works great in the meadow and, and, and go on across. Creek crossing shoes are a must. Your feet are, are tender. They're not, you know, you, you haven't been walking barefoot for most of your life. So you have natural hard skin under there. Uh, it's easy to cut your foot on the edge of a rock. We've been talking about the fact that you're gonna scoot your feet between rocks. Those rocks aren't like smooth river rocks. That's granite. That's very rough. So um, it's, gonna, it's gonna cut you up. Then you're dealing with infections again. Um, you have a ways that uh, little sticks can puncture your feet. I've talked about that. So have some kind of shoe that, that has a hard enough bottom yet wraps up around the size of your foot. It can have lots of holes. It can be, it can be a boat shoe. It can be whatever. Uh, but it has to be able to tie at the top. It has to be able to not only protect the sides of your feet and the bottom of your feet, but it has to uh, uh, get a good grip on the, on the bottom of your leg, the top of your ankle, et cetera, so that when it gets stuck between rocks and you're trying to pull your ankle off the rocks, it doesn't remain with the rocks. And now you're hopping across the creek with one less shoe and, and all that. So uh, I mean, I'm just kind of mentally going over technique. Um, other techniques, so we've talked about facing upstream. We've talked about the train uh, at pros and cons. Uh, singular people going across, tripod position, uh, toe first. We talked about ramps in, ramps out. We talked about strainers downstream. We talked about um, uh, velocities and depths, creating the boulders and the white water and not seeing the bottom. I think we kind of killed it. Make sure that when you get out, you have a nice, warm, sunny place because you're going to be frozen. At least certain parts of you will be very frozen. So uh, anticipate a crossing, uh, look for a crossing place where uh, when you come out of the creek, you can get into the sun and you can uh, 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 warm up and get your clothes back on. And when I say clothes back on, I'm not saying you're doing this thing naked. I'm saying what most people do is they just drop if they've got long pants or they've got long underwear or whatever. If they can't pull it up then just take them off, you're crossing in your underwear, big deal. Um, uh, point. People ask all the time, what do I do with the, the uh, belt strap of the pack? You know, long time ago, yeah, not long time ago, it used to be the maxim, you know, always cross with your belt undone, because if you go down, then you can get away from it. If you've ever watched a pack swept by current, it doesn't like go boom down to the bottom and pin you there and not move. No, it's, it's being thrown and tossed and everything. And so um, it, for, first of all, let's just, let's just start with prevention. 
as with crossing steep snow, you prevent the fall by maintaining your balance with poles. It used to be the thing you always cross with your belt on, be, or off, you know, always cross with your belt off because you could get away from your pack. Um, the fear was it would pin you down. Well, back in those days, we had 80 pound, 60 pound packs. I still do, but I still see, you know, it, they don't sink in, in those nasty creek crossings, even evolution, even in meadows, there's less push, but you're still being pushed along mildly by the, by the creek. So you really don't get pinned, but oh, prevention. That's what I was talking about. You prevent the, the fall in the creek. See, we were just now talking about preventing the fall by using two poles instead of one ice axe. And that was my point. If you use one ice axe to, to plunge it all the way to the head so that it's an anchor for your fall, means that you're almost bent over at the waist going across like a little old person, you know, uh, and you're already out of balance. You prevent the fall by standing upright, using your two poles in the right locations to control where your upper body is going. Same is true with crossing a creek. It's all about controlling your upper body because it's being pushed. It's being buffeted by, by water coming from different directions constantly. So um, you, you prevent it, the, the loss of balance by having that big triangle, extending your poles all the way um, and having two poles. Now, you guys are going to have two poles. You say, okay, Ned, I got that, but I've got that little summer basket size of a ping pong ball. That may sink into uh, any sandy bottom should you lose your balance. So keep your snow baskets on. Much broader uh, surface contact won't sink as far. Uh, your summer baskets are hard. This is gushy soft. Um, there's pros and cons to that. But one of the things, the problems with the hard ones is that when they get wedged between two rocks, it's harder to uh, get, get it unwedged. So I happen to like the soft guys. Um, so th there's not a problem with that. So th that's, the, that's the balance thing. You prevent the fall by maintaining the balance with, with poles fully extended and placed in the right locations, moving one item at a time working your way across the creek in the direction you can see. You've got a ramp exit. You've got a sunny spot to dry out. Uh, take your time. Don't rope up. Um, watch for strainers downstream. A meadow is the ideal. An ideal is a log. Second is a rock crossing. Third is a bush hop. Fourth is the meadow. Dry cross, uh, the ability to dry and ability to cross and stay dry is number one. If you know you got to get in, do it in a meadow. And I think that kills it. Questions? So um, <clears throat> just to kind of recap the waist belt, you're, you're oh. saying to keep it fastened to maintain balance to cross. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, my head is everywhere. The reason why I keep my belt on, you've got, not only are you dealing with your own body's balance, but you've got... I mean, like if this is your body and this is your pack, your pack, where is your pack? Your pack is at the top of the length of your body. So therefore it doesn't take a whole lot of motion in one direction to throw you off plumb. And with all this weight sitting up high, now your, your balance isn't over your feet anymore. Your balance is off to the side of your feet. So if I can control where the monkey on my back is going, then I can, I can prevent the loss of balance. So what happens in reality is that if I lose my balance and my waist belt is undone, you in reality will take your pole and you'll stab it out to the side to catch your balance, right? My upper body is going that way. I wanna stop it from going that way by reaching out and using my pole, which is an extension of your arms to catch my balance. Now I've caught my balance, but my waist belt is undone. Therefore the pack is uncontrollable. And if you have a nasty quick movement, which all of them are, your pack is still moving. You stop, but your pack is moving. Now you've got to deal with that. So it's sort of a bang, bang kind of a problem. Whereas if your waist belt is fastened and you guys, your packs aren't that heavy, so it's not that bad. 
But if your waist belt is fastened, everything's connected. It's like the self-arrest. The self-arrest has to be glued to your chest so that it's, it, it's immovable. Same thing with your pack. When you're being banged around from different directions by water currents, if, if I'm now able to move as one unit and not, and not, okay, my body's moving and now my pack is moving. Those are two different units of motion. I want one, fasten your belt, maintain your balance. The pack is predictable. If you have to catch your balance, your pack doesn't keep moving after you've caught your balance. When you catch your balance, you're catching both the balance of your upper body and your pack when it's connected to you. I would loosen, undo the chest strap, the sternum strap. Um, I'm not a fan of them. Uh, the, pack, the pack will move a little bit if that's undone. I mean, that's the whole point of it. The whole point was to be able to make your pack movement predictable. But in, in a creek crossing, I don't know. You know what? This, maybe this is something that you guys are going to have to decide for yourselves about that sternum strap. But, it, but the principle is keep the pack glued to you so that its motion, its movement is controllable. That's the key. 